Hi everybody, I'm Sarah Dodder. I'm a social worker um, and the DEI coordinator. So you've probably seen emails from me. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I, as far as a, a visual descriptor, um, I'm a brown trans masculine person uh, with dark hair with an undercut. I'm wearing a blue shirt. Um, I have a septum piercing. Uh, that's probably all I got. Um, on behalf of the entire DEI team, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2023 Hispanic Heritage Month panel. Um, and before we move forward with the panel, um, I'd like to first acknowledge the Land and Labor Act, the, or the land and labor that collectively apply to whichever, to wherever each of us is situated. Um, so I'm just gonna read the acknowledgement. Um, we respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we gather is occupied, unceded, and seized territory. We honor and give thanks of gratitude to the Lenai Lenape and Waping, sorry for my pronunciation, the ancestral traditional stewards of this land throughout the generations who allow the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people. Their traditional territories and the secular university that occupy these lands known in Eurocentric epistemology as the USA in New York City. We also recognize and acknowledge that the labor upon which our country, state, and institution are built. We remember that our country was built at the often fatal exposure of forcefully enslaved peoples who were kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their descendants. We also acknowledge all immigrant and indigenous labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked force and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. We recognize that our country is continuously defined, supported, and built upon, built upon by communities and people. We pay respect to the elders past and present. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that have led us to this very moment. Some were here, some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hopes for a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring truth. Please take a moment today to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings us together today. We encourage you to join us in uncovering such truths and the shared responsibility for combating oppressive systems. Um, so this year, the theme of the Hispanic Heritage Month panel and the theme of the panels previously and for the rest of this year um, is being and belonging at Columbia, bridging the gap between the student and alumni experience. So through this panel, we hope to explore stories of activism, resilience, and resilience in creating and sustaining institutional change. Um, as we continue today, please be reminded that live, live captioning is available and you'll be able to ask questions through the Q&A function, which is, there should be a button at the bottom um, that says Q&A. Um, and with that, I want to introduce our moderator today, Anna Vivian Estrella. Um, she is a CSSW alumni, social worker, and attorney. She is an experienced executive with a demonstrated history of working as a change agent in the nonprofit management and is skilled in culture creation, resource efficiency, system development, performance measurement, and strategic partnerships. Uh, Anna Vivian currently serves as the human services director for the City of Norwalk Community Services Department. In this role, she oversees early childhood youth, youth services, fair rent, ADA coordination, municipal agent for the elderly, no, oh, ADA coordinator, municipal agent for the elderly, and the community resource hub administers various grant opportunities. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Anna Vivian. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone had a good lunch so that we could have a healthy conversation because I do anticipate diving into some some topics that we all have experienced in some way or another. So thank you, Sarah, for the Atlanta acknowledgement, for the introduction. Um, just so that you all know, you know, uh, my family origins are Mexican um, and I was born in Mexico. So I became a U.S. citizen, first generation and Columbia alumni. I didn't, when I sent my bio in, remember what year I graduated because it was a number of years ago, uh, but I am a 2011 alumni. I looked it up 
uh, LinkedIn is good for some things besides networking, memory <laughs> being one of them. Uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity to moderate. And I'm going to actually hand it over to uh, the the panel here so that they can introduce their great backgrounds and introduce themselves so that we can get started on this great panel. So Gypsy, if you could unmute yourself and introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you may be right now. Uh, my name is Gypsy Castellanos. I am a um, first generation Guatemalan American born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I graduated from CSSW and the class of 2020. So not too long, but it feels long now. Um, I am currently a adult liver transplant social worker at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, and I am planning to return back to Los Angeles in just a couple of months. Um, but I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here, part of this panel with some familiar faces, some new faces. Great, thank you, Eric. If you could unmute and introduce yourself. Hi everybody, my name is Eric Nunez. Um, I'm originally from South Central California, born and raised. I am class of 2015, I believe, which yeah, 15, um, going on my, um, going on 10 years, which is pr pretty intense to, to think about. Uh, I have lots of experience, but currently I am a private practice therapist. I own my own private practice in uh, Inglewood, California. Really excited to share my expertise and my experience with you all today. Thank you, Marcus. No, Marcos. Good morning. Well, good morning over here in the West Coast. It's actually good afternoon over there. So sorry about that. Uh, my name is Marcos Huerta. I am a alumni class of 2019. It feels weird because I'm like, really? It's been that short of a time. Um, yeah, I, I am originally from Mexico. I was born there, brought to the U.S. as an infant and pretty much raised here ever since. I live in the Bay Area, so NorCal. I am very Happy to be back here, although my heart does miss New York at times. <laughs> Not the winter, but other than that, I miss everything. Um, it's been, you know, a journey after CSSW. I am currently a social work supervisor with Contra Costa County. I've been working in child welfare um, since 2020, and it has just been a roller coaster to say the least. I think um, CSSW prepared me educationally, but I think the real experience came after that. Um, I am happy that I get to serve my community. I get to work with people of color and I really literally have been working in the same community, same streets that I grew up in. So that's been a blessing. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's always exciting to be back and you know, be back in this space at Columbia, even though we're so far away, it feels great to know that there's still, you know, they still remember us. We made a little bit of a legacy there. So we're here. Good to see you all. Thank you and absolutely. Jasmine? Hola, mi gente. My name is Jasmine Tovar. I wear many, many hats. Um, I graduated Columbia 2016. I am the program director of a nonprofit, the Salvadoran American Leadership Educational Fund, where I oversee our transnational work. I am a proud transnational social worker. My work is borderless. I do humanitarian and refugee work in Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador. So I've, I've had the opportunity to go many different uh, refugee camps across you know, Central America. I also am a part-time professor in the Central American Studies Department. It's, it's my passion, it's my joy to be able to work with young Central American students and other students to uplift the stories of why I'm here. I am a daughter of Salvadoran refugees, people that fled a Salvadorian war that was US backed. Um, I know we have folks from Guatemala. Guatemala had a very painful genocide, the longest civil war in Central America, Nicaragua as well. And we're still seeing the consequences of those colonial practices in Central America, which is why a lot of folks continue to be displaced. And then lastly, I am also a student. I think you never stop learning. I am doing my last year of my doctoral studies at USC in a DSW. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. And Josie. Hi, everyone. I um, am a native New Yorker. 
Um, but currently I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina. I graduated in 2019 with Marcos. Um, and after CSSW, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I have been doing my own thing since then in private practice. Um, and I currently own and run a coaching practice that works primarily with women of the global majority and entrepreneurs. And I'm also the host of a podcast um, that sits at the intersection of entrepreneurship and emotional health. And so I'm super excited to be here. Oh, and my background, I um, am second gen Dominican American. Thank you, everybody. Like I said and promised, all great backgrounds, such diversity, um, which is what we're here for today, right? Uh, so I'm going to dive right into the questions for our panelists. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey at CSSW, specifically activism, the importance of your community, uh, the demands, and um, yeah, just anything you'd like to share about that experience. Jasmine. I can go first, because I believe maybe 2016 was kind of like the, like a very important year. So for me, I know that I, as I mentioned, my family fled a civil war. And at a very young age, I was already exposed to social justice, advocacy, understanding that a lot of my family, unfortunately, gave their lives during the Salvadoran civil war. And I have family that are exiled all over the, the world. So I remember when I was a child, um, or more like a teenager, seeing this really powerful image of, of folks saying hands out of El Salvador and it was an alma mater in the main campus and that was my first introduction to 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 Columbia University you know being from LA knew nothing about the east coast and understanding that the Salvadoran civil war a big part of the solidarity movements were U.S. students that supported, that talked against the, the United States intervening in Centro America and so on. So I, in my mind, I, I just believed with all my heart that this place was going to be a, such a revolutionary space for me. And I got there and it was not, right? And I say that with a lot of love. I believe that was part of the process, understanding um, what it was to be in a system, like these systems that were placed to kind of just hold the status quo. And we're social workers, right? I want to believe I'm a social work disruptor, right? We have to disrupt the systems that we are working within. And I think for us, and be, I was the only Salvadoran in my class and, and, and folks in the East Coast not really understanding the Central American experience as much, right? I think folks, because of migration, we're seeing a lot of Central American refugees coming to New York City. So for us, I think there was a lot of group of students who kind of during our like free time, after school, after classes, we're kind of just voicing the concern of indigenous students, of black students, of immigrant students, of Latino students, you know, Latino, the Latinidad, which is problematic term, it's very broad, very complex, very different in every different region of Latin America. And I think for us, we, it was very organic the way that it happened. It was very conversational, healing spaces. Then it came from a place of struggle in terms that we did not feel that administration was supporting the needs of students. And that's when we started organizing. I mean, we were having long days. We were going to field, coming back to campus, 10, 10 p.m., 11 p.m., in midnight, still on campus, trying to figure out what exactly we wanted. Because I think the biggest challenge was that it was a very diverse group of folks, right? It was BIPOC folks. And although we all can unite and the issues that we want more visibility, we want more justice, we want more transformative change and support from administration, we all have different backgrounds. And we, our identities are exposed in many different ways. So it was a lot of conflict mediation between the groups and understanding that, hey, let's talk about anti-Blackness. Let's talk about trans, uh, you know, phobia. Let's talk about this, let's talk about that because all our communities are impacted by this because before we could even go to administration as a united front, we have to work our nuances together. We have to work our internal struggles and we did. And I believe that that just made us such a powerful group because it was not about 
my only struggle. It was about collectively, I care about not just the immigrant experience, but the black experience, which is also the immigrant experience. It's often forgotten. Um, so I think that for us, that was such a crucial moment was just working together. I don't know if other folks want to add things. Well, and I think you brought up some really good points, right? That image of what Columbia University means, that image of what social work means and activism, because we see it in so many different ways in our lives and how it presents and what it means for us to then come to the institution and that reality testing of, oh, actually, it's another system. Um, but then being able to transform that education or move it and use it that's the piece, right? That kind of gets lost. We see the product of it, but we didn't necessarily get to know what that meant or what that would look like when we arrived, that we would be, it would maybe be difficult to find our community in a space that we anticipated to find community or like-minded people. Um, does anyone else want to add to that or expand on it or add in your personal experience? Marcos. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that, Jasmine. It's actually very interesting because like you, I mean, Columbia was always like a school that I saw in movies, right? Like the people love that court, that courtyard, you know, the meeting space, everyone falls in love there. And I was like, oh my God, Columbia, right? So being a Berkeley grad, I was like, it doesn't get any better than this, right? Then I applied to Columbia, got in and I was like, oh wow, like this is actually a possibility, right? Went and toured the campus, they, they sold it. And I was like, yeah, this is great. And then I moved to NYC, obviously, never have lived in the East Coast before. Moved to NYC, we get to the school, and like after orientation, I see a lot of, you know, a few people of color. I'm like, okay, this is great. And then come the first week of classes, we're faced with the prop curriculum. And that is, um, if I remember correctly, um, that is when it started. So it was very interesting to go into the classes. And a lot of us were being called out, not not like directly, but, you know, we were doing activities that were calling out like the privilege, race, oppression, like all of that. And it kind of was a little traumatic at first because as somebody that like, you know, grew up in the Bay Area, particularly in Richmond, California, um, a lot of people around me were people of color, right? So I never really noticed it too much. Like, I, I guess, you know, I always felt like I belonged. And then um, that day, I remember the first day of prop, we get there and all of a sudden, like, we're being asked all these questions and there's so many emotions. I remember people crying and I remember people being upset and being like, well, if you don't like it that much, why are you guys here? And it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, like, our money's, um, you know, like our money's worth something too, you know, we're here. And then as like, you know, the semester went on, and I'm sure Josie could attest to this a little bit, as the semester went on, it started becoming more of like a, like an us them type of thing, it almost felt like, like we would say things and we had to be mindful of what we were saying because it would spark like a debate. And then it became one of those experiences where we were just kind of like, maybe we shouldn't say anything. And then I didn't particularly participate in the demands group, but a lot of my friends did. I was in support, but a lot of it came from fear, right? I was in a new place. I didn't know anybody. Obviously, like I grew up as an immigrant. So that fear was always there. And so things about like, you know, cause that's when also, if I remember correctly, DACA was also attacked the first time. I remember people rallying and I remember people telling me like, don't go, you're not a citizen yet. And it's kind of like, well, hold on. Like what would that, you know, what the, anyway. So it just became like one of those things where like the demands were coming up, people were, you know, going about it. We would have like all these different meetings. I was part of the Latino caucus. I was part of the um, queer caucus. And so it became one of those things where we were just all trying to fight this system and ultimately the pushback that we were getting was always like, well, you know, we gave you prop, we gave you prop. And it's like, yeah, but it's not our job to teach everyone else why this is important. You know, it became like a whole problem where we had a lot of, um, you know, white professors trying to teach us about prop, trying to defend the other, um, you know, white people in the in the room. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it just became like, you don't get our experience and you don't get to learn on the you don't get to learn on the back of us and our own experiences, right? Because we would talk about it and then we would be like shamed for it because people would be like, well, was it really that bad? And it's kind of like, well, you know, so it was a really interesting thing because yeah, the sense of belonging was very hard to find. I think 
we knew we belonged when we were with our other colleagues of color, right? Other people that we identified with, but it was a constant struggle to really make it happen. And for me, at least personally, it was like, how can such a prestige institution make me feel this way, right? And so I was like, I, I love it, it's great. Um, but at the same time, it just always felt, I always felt like the odd one out, like, you know, and I don't know if any other folks that were there when I was there, it was just a very challenging moment. I mean, faculty, staff members, people always wanting to acknowledge that we had prop, but at the same time, it's like, but do you really understand what this is doing, what this is actually about? And till today, I mean, I don't feel like they did. And um, in some ways I feel like they used a lot of the POC people um, to teach about this. And it's kind of like, we were not warned about it. So we still deal with that today. Remembering the fishbowl exercise, I'm like, whoa, damn, like this is really what they put us through. And so some of us were back against that wall and it's kind of like, well, where do I go? The wall is here, move the wall, you know? So it was, it was very, I don't wanna say traumatic because it wasn't like super traumatic, but it was just kind of like something that I will never forget. And people still coming up and being like, okay, but was it really that bad? And it's kind of like, um, you had to be there to understand. <laughs> Absolutely. I do want to just put a plug in here that um, one of the ways that I stay connected to, to our community, our Columbia community, is participating in the PDSA as a facilitator. Um, everything you just mentioned, Marcos, is things that came out in, when we did the Latinx space. Right. So when we did the affinity spaces and I had the privilege of being the lead for the Latinx space, there was so many emotions there. Right. The feeling of being the token, uh, the feeling of having to represent something outside of yourself, having to expose yourself, you know, that that mental exercise of preparing. And this is where I'll say, you know, and I acknowledge the privilege that I wish I had known what it was like growing up surrounded by my Latin community or my Hispanic community. I didn't. I grew up in a space where I was the my I was always the minority and it wasn't expressed as the global majority, right? I was a minority and I was made to feel like a minority. Um, and so recognizing those different experiences of if you have always sat in that role versus entering Columbia, and this is your first time sitting in that role, receiving a master. This isn't your first introduction to advanced education. And if you came from a supportive school or diverse school, and this being truly your first experience in this type of academic system, how daunting that can be and how harsh it can feel and how those microaggressions really pop up. And you know, if you're new to the East Coast and you're still finding your footing, you're still finding your community, how do you still take care of yourself? And I know I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves um, on the questions, but I will, at, uh, you know, further along in this conversation, talk about how did you take care of yourself through those experiences? Uh, we do have a question that I don't want to pass by, but the question is, why is the term Latinidad problematic? And so Jasmine, I know that was during during your conversation. I don't know if you want to speak to it or anybody else would like to speak to it. Um, it depends on what discipline and what perspective you come in. Um, but primarily the idea of Latinidad has been critique um, because of the lack of embracing the fact that there is Afro descendants and indigenous people in Latin America. And not only that, right? Um, we need to understand them because of migration, colonial practices, right? Like El Salvador has a huge vibrant Palestinian community. Belize, which is often forgotten in the conversation with Latin America, has a Hindu community. Peru has a Chinese community, so on and so on with different migrations. Um, it's also uh, the idea of mestizaje, which, you know, now we're getting into like, Chicano studies perspectives are different that you know it's like the cosmic race when in reality it erases a lot of the violence what has happened in Latin America and why folks look like me or folks might look like different um you know different ethnicities also understanding that that does not encompass the idea of Latinidad that is a region it does not encompass a race or race or ethnicity so oftentimes um 
depending on the spaces that you're in, that's why I think folks are embracing more the word Latinx or now it's Latin with the E at the end because the word, the X doesn't really translate into indigenous languages in Latin America as much as the E does. So we're still learning again. Unfortunately, we for many of us, we're, and I'm gonna maybe focus on El Salvador, we're a product of colonization and then continue ever going, uh, you know, interventions in our region. So that really changes our experiences and how we see each other. And I think we're still learning on how to like unlearn these colonial practices and really just figure out who we are as a people. Absolutely. And it can be likened to when people say they don't see color, right? So it's all the same problems with it, that you're not recognizing the diversity, the distinctions, even within our own community. Um, so I hope that was helpful for the person that asked the question and please feel free to put questions into the chat box. I'll try to bring them up um, as we continue this conversation. So to move on to a little bit more of the questions, can anyone or is anyone willing to share a transformative moment, a defining moment and experience that might have spurred your advocacy? Because everyone on here is in an advocacy oriented role um, and really what drove that passion. So uh, I went, when I started at CSSW, I was a career changer. I had been in ed management for many years. Before that, I was a little bit older. I was in my early 30s. So I, you know, came to Columbia with a very clear plan, you know, and I knew that I, upon graduation, I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to work in private practice. Um, and, you know, maybe in the middle of my first year, you know, I started to network and, you know, like everyone I forget what floor, I think it was the eighth floor, wherever like the deans and admissions, like everyone there knew who I was, right? Because I made it a point to network and just ask questions, right? Like, who do I need to connect with? What professors do I need to connect with um, so that I can learn um, how to do this work in the ways that I wanted to do it? Um and, you know, kind of similar to what Marcos had mentioned about, you know, going and having a certain expectation and then getting there and being like, wait, this is not what I thought. That was exactly my experience. And, you know, the message that I got loud and clear, both directly and indirectly, was that if I wanted to go into private practice after social work, after school, or if I was a social worker who wanted to go into private practice, that I was some sort of like sellout, that I really wasn't in it for the right reasons, that there was, you know, how, how could I do this, right? That there is very clear that there was one way of doing that this work and that there was a particular path, right, upon graduation. And, you know, that didn't sit with me because I knew that that was a lie, right? I'd, I'd seen folks and folks who looked like me who were social workers, were, you know, upheld our values, um, were very much about their community, um, and still did the work in the way that worked for them on their terms. And so um, that, you know, I kind of turned my anger, because I became very angry, of course, right, because it was, um, it was very disorienting, right, that, that you know you you go to school right you have your own dreams and then you are told that it has to look a certain way or else you're less than or you you know don't belong in a way to a particular profession and so you know I uh you know started to look outside of CSSW for support and my second year, um, my field placement was at the Ackerman Institute for the Family, which is a training institute. And I went on, uh, went off then after that to become certified with them. Um, but I started to look for mentorship there, right? And really um, talk to other, you know, uh, social workers and, and clinicians and practice owners and folks who were um, not just entrepreneurial, but they were doing really cool projects, right, um, in different places throughout the city. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of like the beginning of um, how I really got into like advocacy there and um, at CSSW um, and really making sure that 
you know, the message for me was less about like private practice. And it was more so about, you know, get really clear on and and what I mean by that is like the message that I would always, you know, be sharing with my fellow students or, um, you know, classmates rather, um, was around like, get really clear on like what you want to do. Go back to your essays. You know, when you apply to CSSW, don't lose sight of that. Sure, you know, we have to do certain things like take a licensure and do all of that, but don't lose sight of why you went into this field in the first place, right? Because I think it can be very, very easy to lose sight of that because there's so many rules, right? There's so many things that you kind of have to do um, that can, can actually make you forget why um why you want you know why you went into social work in the first place so um you know for me it was very much uh you know turning my anger into action and you know lo and behold I I graduated and um you know I was able to go into private practice right after and have been very successful since then that's wonderful and that brings up the huge piece about the field experience right and seeking out community, maybe not in the academic sense or not it, not even at Columbia, but within the networks that are you're creating throughout your career and the spaces that you're you're in and taking up and the, the tables where you're sitting and invited to uh, and really building your own network to support the change you're trying to create uh, and the, on a larger scale. Does anyone else want to speak on a transformative experience? or moment that they had both at CSSW or beyond? Um, for me, you know, when I started Columbia, I started Columbia in 2000 and um, what was that? 2013, so it was 10 years ago. So a lot of things look different than how they do now. Um, for me, you know, I'm, I'm biracial, I'm Puerto Rican and black and coming from South Central. And I was coming in at a, as a 22 year old. So I was very young and I eat thinking that the university was going to create my experience. Um, but little did I know is that I had to create my own experience at Columbia, right? And I want to really emphasize that is that the university is not going to create the experience for you. You really have to, um, one, build your own community, right? Advocate for yourself when it comes to um, holding space or even, you know, um, financial aid um, to everybody on the fifth floor. They have my heart. That financial aid department, y'all have my heart. Okay, because y'all, I look that that's family there. I would definitely have to go to the fifth floor and advocate for myself just to ensure that I was able to survive while at Columbia. Another thing I think that is really important to acknowledge too is I think that um, when we think about our experience as people of color at Columbia, is also identifying that it is a white institute. Um, right, and it's per predominantly white in institute, and those individuals attending Columbia are coming in with some form of expertise or family support, so they know how to navigate the system a bit different. So their responses to the field is, and their approach to the field is going to be different. You know, Josie, just like you, I want to go straight into private practice after Columbia, and I was told that you know I first had to gain experience, which means that people of color have to go into nonprofit work to help other people, right? Because that's why we get into social work. But our white counterparts, it's okay for them to go to Columbia, get their degree, and go straight into private practice, right? So it's very interesting how to like navigate those things. But I think you know it's identifying that. At Columbia, you definitely need to build community. Community is going to be extremely important, not only to, to advocate collectively together as a group, but also to advocate for yourself and to get support from your peers because you're somewhat experiencing all the same thing, same things and need to bounce off of one another. Thank you, Eric, which leads kind of into the next question, which is out of all of these things, what does belonging and um what's the other word, inclusion really mean to you? How does that look to you, that community, that sense of community? I think one of the biggest factors for me at CSSW was having the class above me help open up that space, help um, create that sense of belonging. Um, and I can remember Marcos on like the very first day at my orientation, he was like, listen, this is this is what's happening. This is what you're going to feel. And, you know, you need to make your own community. Um, and going into it, I was just like, okay, like I always felt like I belonged. 
I always felt like I was who I am and I had to learn how to figure out, okay, I'm going to be working. I'm going to be doing field. I'm going to be doing all of this. Like, how do I still make myself feel like myself in these predominantly white spaces? Um, and really it was just creating my family. I was all alone in New York and it was just like, who's going to be helping me? Who's going to be supporting me as and who's going to be feeling the exact same thing as me? And honestly, to this day, it's still very much the same people that I met first day of school, um, who a lot of them still live in New York City with me. And I, you know, just having those emotional breakdowns, especially my first year, of like walking in campus, like the main campus at 12 o'clock after coming home from work, I was just like, wow, like, I'm here, I made it. But I'm also feeling all these things and it's okay for me to feel all of these things. Um, and it really wasn't until my second year that I really made myself known um, with all of my professors, with everybody on the administration team, because I was so scared. I was like, well, if I tell them how I'm feeling, like, are they just gonna tell me that to give up? Um, but it wasn't until really that I was just like, okay, I belong here, I can do this, it's one more year and then I can go home and be with my community. Um, but after all of this, I'm still in New York. I have my community from CSSW, but otherwise like I'm on my, on my own and it's uh, very difficult for a lot of people to feel this way. Um, and I'm very thankful that I've had people like Marcos, like Josie's class to really support in the very beginning as I came through to just make it to where I am today. Absolutely. And you brought up things about like, we use terms like authentic self, right? How do I show up in a space as my authentic self? Um, Eric, I know you had your hand raised uh, when Gypsy started. So I'm going to go to Eric and then I'll come to over to you, Jasmine. But belonging to me looks like taking up space right? Um, I know that we're in an academic setting right now, and we're, you know, there's students here, we're all professionals, um, but I'm going to be a little hood and allow for my self-centralness come out a little bit. You have to take up space. Who gives a fuck about what other people think, right? You're there for the same purposes. So, and, and as we are teaching our future clients and learning how to advocate with other people, right? If we are minimizing our experiences, how can we tell somebody else to take up space or to not do that if we're doing it ourselves. So I think a part of taking up space is accountability, right, for yourself as well and how you're showing up and demanding the space that you are earned because it's a birthright. And elevating others, right? When you're taking up that space, making sure you're elevating those that are coming behind us and those that are coming with us as we continue this journey. Jasmine. I'm going to take it to a whole other direction just because I feel like this is the opportunity. For me, unfortunately, I felt like the community that I resonated as someone who was part of the Latin caucus, they not always, I never felt necessarily that I belong with them. Like I heard a lot of microaggressions from other Latino groups like, oh, Salvadorans talk funny. Salvadorans are all MS-13 and all these stereotypical comments that I just did not understand specifically coming from a city where prime, you know, it's, LA is the largest uh, Salvadoran community outside of San Salvador. So, you know, I understood my culture. I understood my experience. And then it didn't make it any better that I was at, in New York City in 2015 when the Trump, when Trump started announcing he was going to run and he started using um for his negative immigration rhetoric, he started using, unfortunately, the MS-13 killings in Long Island. And that just made it very hostile to be somebody from El Salvador in New York City, because I heard a lot of comments in the classroom about immigration, about refugees, about how everybody from El Salvador is from MS-13, and all these negative comments that I just did not understand, especially being in a space where we're all social workers, and we're here to, we understand historically, 
why things happen, policy, why things happen. And to hear from my own peers was very hard. And I think that was the first time that I really understood that unfortunately, even if you have uh, affinity groups, it does not mean there's not going to be conflicts. There's not going to be microaggressions and really just kind of working through with those emotions because I felt more supportive from folks who did not identify with being Latino, but other students of color than I did with the primarily Latino community that that did make fun of how I spoke my Spanish. And and and, and then every time I brought it up in conversations, like, oh, we don't mean it. It's just a joke. And I was like, no, it's not. It's harmful. And if and if you're going to be working in a refugee community, most likely you're going to come across folks that look like me, like my parents, who are Central American, and those perspectives, you're already hurting us. So for me, I think that I had to learn how to navigate such a hard space. Um, but it was a, a place of, of, of learning for other folks. But again, going back to Marco's conversation, it was in my job to teach my peer Latinos about my own experience either. Absolutely. Um, and belonging takes all different shapes, right? So like you mentioned, affinity spaces might be comfortable for some people, but not for others. You might have to find your own peoples. It might be outside of Colombia. It might be you know, some of the field placements, you have access to students in other schools and professors and, and people in different professions that are working in the same space. So networking to Josie's point and Marco's point and Eric's point of just really getting out there and I think staying open, right? Making sure that you're you're still available to make those connections, even if it's not in the places we thought we would find it or in the places we wanted to find it. Um, so we'll move on to what about mentorship? Because we've talked about building family and building community, but what about mentorship? Um, Josie, I know you talked about your field placement, really reaching out for that, but what did, you know, like, what did it look like? How did you achieve it? And what did it mean to you? Yeah, so even before I got to that field placement, which is my second year, um, when it comes to mentorship, and I, I forgot who said it here. Oh, um, I think it was you, Eric, around like, um, you know, taking up space. And, you know, as I mentioned, I went with a lot of intentionality back to school. Um, and so I made it a point to only have professors who were um, folks of the global majority. And I was very successful, which I know, you know, is not the experience for most people, but every single professor that I had there um, was someone who looked and sounded like me. And so that kind of had like its own embedded mentorship for me because then, you know, I was in their inboxes like, hey, let's grab coffee and, you know, like, let's talk about this thing. And, you know, this other thing is happening at the school. Like what, you know, can you be a thought partner in terms of like how I should handle it? And, you know, um, I had like a really strong community there. There was a group of like, I had a group of friends and, you know, we were mostly in each other's classes. And so, you know, it was kind of, everything was kind of built in because, you know, we would, um, you know, request time from a professor, but it wasn't just me, it was also my friends, right? So for me at the school, it was very much um, professors that I was really um, intentional about cultivating those experiences, but then also folks like Karma, right? Who, um, and Tomomi, right? Folks who I was just like, what in the world is happening? And you know, like you, Eric, I was like, you know, I'm from New York. So it's like, do I really need to, like, I, I'm ready to pop off, but like, how do I do so without necessarily getting kicked out of school? Right. Um, because it was, it was definitely a time. And so that was kind of like from the uh, academic perspective. And then, you know, when I got to Ackerman, um, you know, I was a part of the social work and diversity program that was, um, like the name of like the field placements, if you will. Um, and so that was just so incredibly supportive, right? I had, there were, it wasn't just me, right? There were other students from other social work schools in New York City. And, you know, our supervisors were like world renowned, like family therapists. So these are folks with just like a wealth of experience. Um, and there were also folks of the global majority. So 
everything there was just, I, I felt like I was wrapped in a, in a onesie, right? If you will, um, in that program, it was just, it became a really safe space for me to, um, you know, uh, to be able to share my experiences at the school um, and really allow myself to be held. So there was there was very much like an embedded mentorship there. So those are just like two examples of kind of um, mentorship that you kind of have to seek out yourself and then mentorship that I know I was incredibly lucky to have in a field placement. I'm gonna take the opportunity to just be really grateful for the uh, the professors who did support a lot of the student movements and the student demands. Um, I know now that I'm a professor, I understand in a personal level what it is and what limitations it is to be a a, a scholar of color. I understand that a lot of folks are playing a lot of things on the line just to support students. And it should not be like that, but it is like that, unfortunately. And I know for me, just thinking of Dr. Marti and Dr. Cavasa, who's no longer there, and Karma and other folks, I know that they had their own internal struggles. And I know they did not necessarily support what was happening to students, but they also had their limitations. But I know that they were such a big part of supporting us, even after hours, even in the weekends, and even somebody as Dr. Marty, who I think is still there, you know, I, I still, all everything I learned from her social work practice and everything she did in our trip to Chile um, is something that I still use. I do international trips to El Salvador all the time, legal observing, all these things. And a lot of the practices that she taught us, I still use to this day. So I think that I just want to highlight, and I always, every time I talk to students who want to go to Columbia, I'm really honest about its limitations and everything, and it's great things. There's great things that also happen at Columbia, but I do always elevate the, the professors and the faculty, and to Eric's point, everyone in that fifth floor, all the, oh, oh my God, I think that if it wasn't because of folks in the financial aid department, I probably would have ended up homeless. And they helped me ensure housing and funds when I unfortunately lost housing in the middle of my program. And I'm just so grateful. So I think those mentorships and, and that support is so important to just ensure, especially for us, for folks who are not from New York City, who do not have family systems there. And of course, being a good Latina girl, I didn't want to tell my parents, hey, mom, I'm about to be homeless. You know, they were my support systems. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Marcos. Yeah, I think mentorship is obviously very important as somebody that, you know, obviously I, I went from the West Coast to the East Coast. And so it was really interesting because although I tried to convince myself that I was going to stay in New York, I, I knew the reality was that I wasn't. So I was like, okay. So I went into like this internal struggle where I was just like, is it really worth networking here if I'm not even going to stay here? Right. And obviously, like I had um, like Josie, a lot of my professors are people that look like me. And one particular professor that I always remember, um, Maria Studio was my I can't even remember what the class was, but I came in there with a very closed mind in terms of clinical work. I was like, I don't want to be a clinician. I don't even want to do private practice. I'm here. My goal is child welfare. I knew Little did I know what I was getting myself into, but I knew, right, like what I wanted. And then I remember her talking to me and being like, you know, for somebody that doesn't want to be a clinician, you're good at it. And I was like, ah, OK, thank you, whatever. <laughs> and then she was like, you should really consider a clinical internship. Um, I didn't listen to that. I didn't do a clinical internship. But here we are, you know, years later. Um, literally just need to take my test to become a, a licensed clinical social worker in California. But it's one of those things that she sparked that interest. And it really meant a lot because after that, I was able to get a summer job with my networking with her. I was able to connect with people like Karma, again, fifth floor financial aid, y'all like really made it happen. I remember going in there and being like, how am I going to survive with this money? Like, I, you know, I can't. And I used to get mad because I would be like, you know, here I am trying to better myself. And, uh, you know, people are over here worrying about, their views out their window or their vacation over spring break and I'm like bro like I don't even get to go out I, I, I'm lucky if I go home right <laughs> so it became one of those things where it was like really networking with everyone else I like Gypsy said earlier the class above me we had really amazing um, mentors that we looked up to um, shout out to Darrell and Pablo if you guys are watching this you know I will always remember that but they really you know 
helped create the community. And then when my time came, when we were the upper, like the upper class, like I was like, you know, we got to show up and show out for these people. You know, we got to show up and show out and show Colombia who we really are and what we're about. And I took a lot of pride in being able to like really just surround myself with other, you know, people of color. We had the men of color um, space. We had all these different things that I took a lot of, um, that, that I took, you know, advantage of that I went there that I was like okay and it was really interesting because I think never in my educational career had I been so involved in so many different things to the point where I was like oh my god I have another meeting today like wait hold on what is this one you know but it felt great because we still keep up with each other you know a lot of us still have each other on LinkedIn that's a big big key if you're out of NYC and you're at Columbia although the name does carry I'm not even gonna lie to you it's a high price to pay but the name carries um network with the people, you know, congratulate them on work anniversaries, they will do the same. And that is literally what has kept me afloat with everyone over there. Lorenzo, um, obviously, is another person that I keep in contact with great network opportunities. But I I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the education I got at Columbia, yes, great. I have a master's degree, it looks great, right. But what I really got out of Columbia was the people that I met there that helped shape my experience that I still look back at today. And it's like, hey, without you guys, I would have never been able to survive this experience and shout out to the class of 2019 because i know we had it rough but hey we're still family and I, just like high school like we need a, we need a reunion y'all for real i think you can include other alumni ages in there you know i might have graduated a couple of years before you but i'd like to be included as well um so you know, I know we're running out of time or we did run out of time, but I also really, really want to elevate self-care. Um, that's something that, you know, Marcos talked about. He might have not made it through Columbia. And I know during my time at Columbia, some people didn't make it. And that's OK, too. Right. Like self-care, self-care, self-care. It's something that in my positions, thankfully, you know, as directors, as chief officers, as EDs, as CEOs, we have the opportunity to push that forward. Um, but I really just want to give you guys the opportunity to highlight what does self-care look like for you? Um, how did it change and evolve throughout the years? Because it's really, really important um, as some, you know, because of our experiences, because of what we're going through, what we're sharing, what we need to do, that that's a piece that I just I want to make sure we at least touch on it a little bit before we wrap up. Um, so I have boycotted the term self-care because, you know, it's been co-opted at this point and, and watered down. And I really like to think of it, but I mean, that's just me, but I would, I really like to think about practices that keep me whole, right? Because there's just so many things that, um, you know, are, uh, banking on us not staying whole. And so I think that, when I frame it as what are the practices that keep me whole, then it really forces me to think about those things that are really nourishing for me. And, you know, because kind of this, the overarching theme here has been around like adv um, advocacy and activism, I just cannot stress how important rest has to be a non-negotiable part of your activism. Like there's just no ifs, ands, or buts. Like it's just, I, I just, I cannot underscore how much and how important it is to figure out what rest looks like for you. It doesn't necessarily mean going on vacation. It can look like whatever, but you have got to be really clear on what that's going to look like for you and really be devoted to it, right? Like not just committed, but really truly devoted. Um, because again, if you go back to your why, um, your why is depending on you being well. And so, you know, I know that I have a ton of privilege because I work for myself and so I can make my my schedule and, you know, I don't really work past four. Right. But that was that's really I was really intentional about that. Um, and so, you know, like for me, that is it's really about how I spend my time during the week. 
Um, so uh, like a non-negotiable, um, like part of my week, for example, is making sure that I start my day with my rituals and I end my day with my rituals. That ensures that when I am, you know, when I meet with my clients or um, I'm recording my podcast, for example, I am the best version of myself because I spent a long time being incredibly burnt out and I thought that I was doing good work and I really wasn't. You know, um, and it took a lot of panic attacks and a lot of like health scares for me to realize that, unfortunately. Um, and I just really wish that folks um, I don't wish that on anyone. So um, that's like what what it looks like for me and just like a, a piece of advice for folks who are tuning in. Absolutely. And we do, you know, the words in nonprofit constantly change um, and they do get watered down. They do get co-opted. They do. It, so whatever phrase you need to use for yourself, I think it's just that promotion of how do you keep yourself whole, true to yourself? How are you kind to yourself? Um, you know, so I just want to throw that out there that I, we're using the term self-care, but it's really whatever, whatever term, whatever saying, whatever motto you need to embed into your own practice to be kind and generous and thoughtful of you and your space and your needs. Eric? I think for me, you know, uh, my journey within self-care has been um, checking in with myself to see my capacity, right? And I really want to, you know, suggest that it's checking in with yourself as you're doing this work to see where you're at, right? What capacity you're at, because sometimes the work makes you feel like you have to overextend yourself and then you lose yourself in the work and that's what you want to prevent, right? Another thing that I think about when it comes to self-care as well is, um, start practicing what it looks like to choose yourself versus choosing the profession. If you care about the profession, right, then when choosing yourself, there you're going to do your profession, right? And taking breaks from the work. The work is not going anywhere. It's still going to be there tomorrow. So you could take a day for yourself to regroup and recharge to then show up as your best version of yourself, how Josie mentioned. So self-care is definitely uh, crucial. Please make sure that uh, when it comes to self-care that you don't see it as being selfish because there's nothing wrong with being selfish. Absolutely. Gypsy? Mine was very simple, was to make a home-cooked meal that reminded me of my childhood. Those were the best nights that I had, just really reflecting on where I came from and who I wanted to be and wherever I was. So those those moments were the simplest for me. I know you're saying simple, but like if I tried to recreate one of my childhood meals, it would come out terrible <laughs> and no one would eat it. And maybe there's some kindness in that. too. <laughs> no, but thank you. And that that reminder of home base. Right. And and our senses. It's not just about doing something, but our senses, taste, smell, uh, experience, touch, all of those things. Jasmine. A lot of the folks said similar things I was going to say, but I just want to tell all the students that are seeing is that the system is there to get us tired. The system is there to get us, um, to make us give up, not want to continue doing the work. It's doing its job and we're navigating all these systems. So this is why self-care and I call it soul care because I agree with Josie self-care. It can be a complicated term nowadays because it's been co-opted, but you need to take care of yourself. The most revolutionary thing and the most transformative thing you can do is to take care of yourself because the system is always going to be there to get you tired, to get you weary, to get you to continue to traumatize you. So I think we need to continue recognizing because a lot of us are going to continue navigating these systems to Eric's point. The work's always going to be there. So just remember that it's doing its job. So take your time, whatever that looks like. Um, and and just definitely for folks who are going to graduate, I know that for a lot of us, we don't have the luxury to take time off. I understand that's a privilege. I graduated and I ran to El Salvador to do some humanitarian work. But I would say just really take time to process your experience at Columbia, specifically for folks who were student organizers, because I felt like the year after I graduated, it took me a whole year to sit down and just cry of some of the things that I had to carry and I did not let go and I did not recognize that it was impacting me in a deeper level. So take that time to process your experience and just see where life takes you after that. Absolutely. Marcos? 
I mean, just really adding on to what everybody said, you know, taking care of yourself is a big thing. I mean, I used to hear the term self-care all the time. And I was like, well, what is that? Like, I, I don't have money for a vacation. I don't, you know, and then I realized it really had to channel what I was going through and really creating my own time for that. Like, I think when I was in CSSW, I think I called my mom every single day that I was there, unless we were mad at each other, then I didn't. But other than that, like I called her every day. I called my network back home. I can think of the days when I ran to Gypsy and like cried and like we cried together because we missed California. We missed the tacos out here. We missed the burritos because, you know, NYC ain't it when it comes to that stuff. I'm sorry to say. Um, but it just, you know, it was one of those things that like really evolves over time. And, you know, it wasn't until like I started the work. Obviously, child welfare is a very complex system. It's really hard. It's really stressful. So having your network outside of here, having someone to talk to, having those people that you can open up with and going to therapy. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I think my therapist is probably like, yo, like I'm banking off of Marcos, but I'm like, no, but you got to understand you can't give yourself therapy. And I think people don't understand that people get so caught up in the fact that well I'm a clinician like I can do this I can do that but then it's like wait a minute you can't CBT yourself bro like you just can't do it right so it took it took a lot to go back to like really demystify that because people were constantly saying well if you go to therapy you're crazy coming from a lot like you know a Mexican background people going to therapy automatically is like oh something's wrong they're crazy you know they can't do it and it's just kind of like no 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 this is for me you know and then you know I got into the supervisory work here and it's just really reminding yourself why you do the work being the best version of you so that you can pass this on to the people that you are working with and supervising reminding them taking a minute every day when something is good acknowledging that I operate under the mentality of like be the supervisor you would want and I always tell my staff you know sometimes things go right and I'm like hey you know you did a really good job today I make the habit of saying good morning to everybody in the morning because you know what that goes a long way if you're going to do the work you need to feel like supported but other than that it really is just a token of appreciation right you talk to everybody you really go out there show up show out hey i'm here if you need me let's break this down my door is always open but it's really about remembering that that is self-care too you know you make yourself available you take the time for yourself i know when i leave the, the my job space it took a lot for me to learn this but i turn off my phone and i'm like you know what tomorrow morning whatever the problem is I'm going to be there to do it. If it's after work hours, there's nothing that I can do. So why am I going to disrupt my sleep because of this, right? So it's one of those things of like taking care of yourself, showing up refreshed, ready to go, and just reminding everyone, you know, social work is not easy. It's not a career that makes a lot of money either, unless you know how to like, you know, really navigate it. But it's really making sure people understand this is what you're going to do, but it's not all bad. Like you get the self, you know, you get self like, um, what is it called? You know, you you reward yourself with knowing that you did the right thing, but at the same time, it's a fun teaching experience that you can take with you. And it just feels great to know when you start making a difference. I am always excited to see how Columbia is doing and how they're moving forward. And it's like, you know, we started a little bit of that. It was a little grain of sand that we put in there, but it's what we do. Social workers, we care too much, but if we're going to care that much about the work that we do, you need to start here. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't go and take care of anybody else. Absolutely. I mean, can we just talk about like mic drop? I will say I do want to add just one thing that we've talked a lot about navigating systems. But one of the luxuries of taking up space, showing up, really being a disruptor and activist, all of those pieces is that sometimes we get the privilege of being in the position to create a system. Right. So I had the the fortune of being on a panel where it was all BIPOC panelists, well, like this one, but I meant uh, we were reviewing applications for uh, grants. And most of the people that were applying for funds were individuals that maybe didn't have the privilege to go to Columbia, but they were trying to do good work in the community. And for the first time, all three of us, that was the first time where it was a minority female-led panel to do these reviews right? That space that we were taking up. Um, and we were the ones who created what that looked like, what the process looked like, the application process, the review process, who got what. And so it gave us the opportunity to break down those systems that are historically set up for us to fail or to get burnt out or to 
you know, not get the equal footing. So anytime you can, you have that opportunity to take up that space to revamp something, change something, um, really make that change that will impact future generations, right? It will make it that much easier for someone in my community to get a grant because I set up the application with systemic racism in mind, right? And making sure that we didn't put any unintended barriers in place um, so I appreciate everyone on here. And I know that Lorenzo said I could ask the second question, although I think we spent a little more time on self-care, important topic, uh, but just one sentence on, um, what would your suggestions be to students on sustaining activism, activism in social change at Columbia? See what's missing and um, advocate for it, right? Look at your cohort, see what's missing on campus or within the student um, union and advocate for it, fill in the gap. Absolutely, that's a great one. Um, I would say, don't be afraid to look outside of the School of Social Work. I think for me, some of the folks that were some of the biggest supporters were students in the undergrad, students at Teachers College. I have a lot of love for folks at Teachers College because our my activism started uh, in the School of Social Work, but then I ended up supporting other schools and other movements. And I think that was really special. Trust yourself and trust your voice and trust those around you. I would just reiterate what I mentioned before around rest being a non-negotiable part of your activism. I'm going to say show up, show out, and really, like, you know, read the room. There's other people out there that are literally going through the same things you are, maybe not the same exact things, but don't be afraid to look out and like really ask, ask questions, raise your voice and make yourself known. You know, at the end of the day, you're there, you belong there and you make the experience. You do not want to live with regrets. Make it your own. Get it done. Thank you. That's all really, really great advice, great words and thoughts. And I appreciate the vulnerability that was shared here and the honesty, um, because I think that's that's the best way to support those that have attended this session, those that are in the room, um, and those to come. There's a question in the chat. The question was, as an online student, I feel like I'm not making the most of my experience any ideas to change that I feel disconnected? Um, just to share what I wrote in the chat, um, as someone who was in person and took online courses, um, it was purposeful that I reached out to other Latinx, BIPOC students. Um, and even if it was just to like split the readings and, you know, do things or, um, you know, if I had questions on whatever it was, like I knew I had people to also support me in that in that way, aside from like building a really genuine relationship with some of these online folks as well. So being intentional about it. Right. Jasmine? So I'm also a student. So I'm a DSW student. Um, and I feel like it's online. And although I do not physically see these folks. In, 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 a re in a real space, I see them every evening, three times a week. And I feel like one of the things that has helped us connect is just really utilizing Zoom, LinkedIn, Facebook groups, uh, WhatsApps, and we're always texting each other. And I got to be mindful because folks are in different time zones. <laughs> but I also recognize like we check in about each other's assignments and just sometimes just in general, just like Hey, how are you doing? I realized that you were tired in class, and that and that's something that we've been really successful in my cohort. I'm not. I don't understand. I don't really know how big the MSW cohorts are, um, but just definitely utilize technology. I feel like it's such an important tool for me. I have family all over the world, so technology is what keeps me close to my family. And there's so many different options out there. You can start online groups, and folks will join. Absolutely, Marcos. I think that, you know, what um, Jasmine just said is very important. I think when the biggest thing that I would say is reach out to all the different caucuses, look at who the leaders are, reach out, email. One of the beauties about um, attending CSSW, though, is it's a it's a very, you know, 
one of the oldest social work schools, if not the first one, I always say that people try to defer and fight me on that, but I'm like, no, facts are facts. Um, but what I will say is maybe start an online caucus. One of the great things about CSSW is they're always open, they're always ready. When I was there, I remember we started a caucus as a result of one of my human sexuality classes. I am glad to know that it's still there, but Columbia does have very supportive people there that can guide you through it. And I always thought, and I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea to start online caucuses and that you guys can continue to like be in um, communication with the caucuses already in place. I would encourage that. It's something that's great. I belonged and worked with a lot of the caucuses and it was a big experience. So I, I would I would encourage you advocate for that if that is something that you're willing to take the initiative for. Because like, like I said, you're not the only student that's online. There's a lot of other Latinx students that are there, a lot of other, you know, BIPOC students that are wanting to get a sense of belonging. So why not go ahead and start it? We do have an alumni um, thing over here in California that, like, you know, it's a part of it. So really just go in there, go in there, look for the opportunities and hey, if you can start something, start a movement, it's gonna feel great, believe me. And you're gonna be paving the way for the people to come. So don't be afraid to start. Also showing up, right? You came to this session, so that that shows that you're you're getting involved. And um, just to highlight something, Marco said is that the alumni network does extend nationwide, right, and internationally. I see some events, and I'm like, man, I wish I was over there so that I could attend that event. Um, but it's really nice to see uh, that the alumni network does have extensive meetups and different opportunities to connect in person, even if you were an online student and you didn't, maybe you didn't get that experience or that feeling while you were a student. Um, anything else or any other questions? I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a question in the chat. It says, there, for those of, on the panelists who are in private practice, what is the population you work with and do you take insurance and how do you charge your clients? Thank you, Eric. I was looking at the other, the Q&A box. So yes, thank you. And I believe there's also another question. So can we answer it for the people that are in private practice? Can we answer that question? Uh, I'm, I'm currently in private practice. And I think one thing that Columbia fails to do when it comes to school of social work is that, yes, there is this public service aspect of it, but social work is also a business. And I think that there's missing the business component of social work, right? Yes, we are going to school to help other people and to do the work, but we also want to make some coins doing it, right? We still have to sustain ourselves. So I think um, that's something that should be introduced to School of Social Work is how to um, understand the business component um, and aspects of social work. Um, when it came to the private practice, it was very challenging for me creating a private practice, right? Going from New York City to California, one thing they don't tell uh, folks who don't live in in New York City or from New York is that different states are gonna have different requirements when it comes to your licensure exam. So you want to make sure that you take these um, extracurricular classes while at Columbia so that you don't have to take them after you graduate from Columbia, one component, right? And then also the ins and outs of cultivating or creating a business coming from a nonprofit mindset or, um, or just a social work mindset in general, it's a, a completely new territory. Currently right now I am doing high functioning adults I am on insurance panels, but insurance, I like to call myself a radical therapist and I think insurance is our scam and how they treat social workers. Um, so I do take insurance, insurance, but I don't, but most of my clients are paid out of pocket. Um, I can jump in here. I So I uh, used to be in private practice. I actually don't practice therapy anymore. I released my license last year. Um, and pivoted exclusively to coaching. Um, but when I did work in private practice, um, I did not take insurance and um, I just served exclusively Black and um, uh, Latinx uh, individuals and, and couples. Um, and yeah, I 100% agree with what Eric is saying. Um, I used to do business coaching for therapists in private practice for the same reason. Um, but the the great thing about now in 2023 is that, you know, if you know that you wanna learn the business side of chiropractic or therapy, 
Um, there are now so many, um, you know, courses and programs and coaches out there that, you know, were not around when I was coming out of school. I, I don't know, that was your experience as well. Um, so now at this point, you're like in a really good place because it's no longer as taboo, I think, as it used to be even three, four years ago. All this to say, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Like, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. It's just about, you have, like, you have to learn how to play the game. It's pretty much what it is. This is a game. Unfortunately, a lot of folks um, have to pay, right, in order to be a part of that game. But this is a game. And what I mean by that is, like, the system is really a game. And, um, you know, we just have to be really honest about that it's a game and we have to learn how to play it right? Because otherwise it's just going to continue to play us and play the, the people and the communities that we really care about. Um, but whatever you want to do, you can do it. It's just figure out how. Absolutely. Um, so I'm not in private practice, but I work with a lot of people who do it. Um, my understanding is supports that they received was that they reached out to their alumni networks because chances are there's a lot of people out there in private practice within our own networks, uh, chamber of commerce, local chamber of commerce or business districts. Um, there's a lot of nonprofits out there that are specifically trying to help elevate people that are in trying to launch businesses because it nonprofit is a business, private practice is a business. And so it's not just about insurance and billing, um, but there's also apps for that. Uh, so there's different things and platforms that don't, you know, this work functions and it changes. And so there are different things that you can pay and it does the medical billing, but there is a process to make sure you can get on those panels. But those that are taking up that space right now would be your best guides. Um, thankfully, a lot of it's also virtual. So when you do figure out where you're going to set up shop, you know, hang up your little shingle, you, you want to talk to your local businesses. I know here we also have a redevelopment office and they help people through that entire step. But, but that's something that the city that I work in and live in um, has committed to doing in order to help people uh, launch those businesses, not just social work businesses, but businesses in general. So, you know, look to the town, the city, the state that you're planning on in for those resources as well because sometimes they do have some really really helpful um, agencies or partners that could could help you shepherd you through that process um, I see there's another question here what were your areas of study at CSSW and how did you decide Jasmine so I was AGPP, even though I had two very clinical um, internships. Why? I don't know. <laughs> so I feel like that gave me a good combination of being able to do so many different things. I mean, for me, it was probably the best um, because I do so much. I do from grant writing to program evaluation um, to transnational work to academic work. So I think it provided me with the framework to be able to do a little bit of everything. And also, I always tell students, being a social worker, even if you decide to be a clinician or in the policy track, we can do almost anything because our field is so broad and it teaches a lot of things. But I would say, to Eric's point, if you do want to focus on clinical, um, take advantage of those classes. You know, I took some clinical classes and although... I, my sister's also a social worker. She's a clinician. I always go back and forth. Do I want to go one day back to being a clinician and practicing and finishing my hours? And that's an option I have. I don't know if I'm going to ever do it, but just kind of think of what's best for you and what makes sense in the long, long run. Marcos? I too was AGPP. And really what sold it for me was going in there. I went to Columbia with the thing in mind that I did not want to be a clinician, right? And then when I got there, I started to see the clinical courses and I started to see what everybody was taking. And I was like, oh, what if I do want to become an LCSW later? Like, um, and so very similar to what Jasmine said, I, I just told myself, you know what? AGPP is the closest program that lets you double dip into both of the programs. So I did all of my clinical courses. Like Eric said, I looked at the California requirements. I took all of that at Columbia when I got to... Um, Back to California, all I had left was the 18-hour course 
for um, law and ethics. And then um, I was I was prepared. I was ready. And it really, like I said, it really was just one of those dipping, you know, my feet into both waters type of thing. My placements were not clinical, but um, taking the classes that you are required to take um, also prepare you a little bit clinically. And like the advantage of it is that you can take clinical courses. AGPP was, I, I don't regret it one bit. I did get a lot of practice with programming and contracts and all of that. And so when I started my job and I started seeing like the different things, I was able to understand, you know, the program evaluation part. So really, I mean, I just thought AGPP was, was the way to go and it worked for me and it has worked for me. I completed my hours here in California. I was able to get my um, ASW, no problem. I'm currently just waiting to test to become an LCSW. And again, I don't do a lot of clinical work, but it's just continue to learn, continue your learning, and it, it, it could be done. It could be done. Just look at wherever you are, the requirements, and just do those classes, and you too can become licensed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Josie and Gypsy both mentioned that they did the clinical tracks because they wanted to be clinicians, and Gypsy specifically said um, a medical social worker. I will say that I was separate. So I did SEA. Social Enterprise Administration, which now has a new name that I can't remember because it's super, super long. Um, but because I had come in like Josie as an older student, um, I had already practiced in a lot of different areas. So domestic violence, family services, things like that. And clinical classes overlapped with places that I had already been trained to work in those areas. So I chose a more administrative track. Um, and to what Marco said, like the, all of that helps, right? All of those experiences. So even if you're on a clinical track, I would say try to take some of the other classes so that you can have them under your belt because the more global your experience is, the more global it, your knowledge base is, the better it will be. Because although you might be providing therapeutic services, you need to understand the billing part of it, the business part of it. Um, you want to understand the system part of it because it does overlap and interact with your work. Um, so, so I will just say, you know, the more well-rounded you can make your education, the better it will be in your experiences. Uh, when you're looking at providing therapy in your own pieces, you know, therapy has different models and modalities and they fit within a system. And so it just goes back to everything's kind of interconnected. And so you want to be position yourself where you understand it uh, because um, if you understand your role, you also are less likely to get taken advantage of. So just to put it out there, the Spanish speaking clinicians are extremely in high demand. And so if you do not know how to value yourself, how to negotiate your salary, how to do those pieces, um, you may be undercutting yourself. And it also means that that person coming in behind you, you might be putting them in a position where they're advocating more on both of your behalfs, right? So you just want to be uh, as knowledgeable as possible so that you can be competitive um, in your own field and advocating for yourself as well. So advocating for others, but yourself as well. You have huge value in this industry. Is there any questions? I don't see any in here. Oh, there we go. Oh, what are your thoughts on the licensing exam and passing? Some view this exam as gatekeeping. Any thoughts? It is gatekeeping. Let's just be upfront. Let's be 100 about it, right? The exam is is to um, scare folks away from, you know, completing the process. The exam process in California was very hard for me. I'm full transparency. I didn't pass my first time and that really did discourage me. I missed by one point and then I passed it again. My I passed it this, my second time around. Um, but when you think about the exam itself and all of the documentations or fees that go into getting licensed, all of it is a scam to me. But good luck. Do it anyways, because the LCSW is definitely going to take you to the uh, next part of your career within social work if you want to remain within social work. I second that. It's a really expensive process. I too, I, I, I don't openly admit it because it did take a toll. I also didn't pass the first time. I'm waiting to retest. I missed it by two points and I was 
devastated. I was like, really? Like all of that, I had to get all these hours and I still got to do it again. And I think it didn't even hurt that much to not pass it. I think what hurt is the fact that I have to pay that uh, exam fee again, which is just ridiculous. I am like, what the heck? Like I have to pay this. I ha And then I had to renew my ASW because here I was thinking, oh, if I pass, I can skip that. Nope. I had to renew. I had to pay again. And it's just really one of those things that like at first, you know, it, it is kind of like, oh my God, everyone else had it, you know? And then I come to like, you know, talk to my networks and they're like, you know, we didn't pass on our first try. And I was like, well, none of y'all said anything. And they're like, well, you felt the same way. So, you know, just keep doing it. Just I agree wholeheartedly with what Eric said. It is a money taking thing, but at the end of the day, you just have to remember, I the way I think about it is I'm doing it to help myself and to help my people. So at the end of the day, that's what keeps me going. But yeah, those fees are ridiculous. The testing prep is ridiculously expensive. I'm just at the point where it's like, you know what? I've come this far, I'm gonna get it, get it done. And just think about it this way. You're going to be another POC that's an LCSW and you're going to add to that, to that, um, what is it, to that trajectory. So that's what keeps me going, honestly, because if it was up to me, I would be like, man, forget this. It's too much money, but it's worth it. Jasmine. Not a clinician and I do not have an LCSW, but I would say just seeing my sister in her process of getting licensed herself, she's going to sit in this exam, is that she worked really close with her colleagues and her classmates and it is very expensive folks so I know that they like printed things out and they share things and they create google docs and they work together to ensure that folks are passing um you know I always tell folks come to the office I have a bunch of free printing I'll print what it ever folks want for so you can have visuals but just work with your community because if you're going through the process of licensure your colleagues are as well. And if you work together, I, I can only anticipate that it's gonna you're gonna have a greater impact in that process. Yeah, and I mean, this isn't the only exam, right? So there's gatekeeping in every industry. Um, and it is a gatekeeping tool. It, some of it's for good reason and some of it's just uh, for the reasons we are alluding to on this call. Um, but I will also give shout outs to Connecticut. They had in, they had um, implemented an LMSW exam, found it to be statistically uh, racist. And so they suspended uh, doing the LMSW exam, which is, um, you know, so I give them credit for that because it's self-reflection. Now uh, for the LCSW, I don't know which board because I don't practice clinically, so I'm not as invested in that. But that's also something to go back to, right? If there is, has it been tested or retested more recently to see if there's any any racial components in there? And I'm not sure what the answer is, um, but I will give it out there to the broader community if that's something that someone would like to look into. And I want to shout out to Emily, who said that she has been inspired through this call uh, to start her own group. And so I appreciate that. And thank you again to all the panelists. It's been really great being here with you all. Yeah, thank you to the panelists and to Anger Vivian. And thank you for all of you who are attending uh, virtually or in person. 